Beautiful boomers. Standing Rock, a lesson in sacred activism to the civilized world. A lot of you probably know about the largest attempted genocide of First Nations people in what is now United States of America, otherwise known as Turtle Island. However, this powerful, badass culture still lives and thrives. And we have an emblematic representative of this spirit here with us, a grandmother, an elder, and an all-round badass, like I said, actually won a badass award, a rebel with a cause <laughs> award. Yeah. All right, I would just like you to welcome LaDonna Bravebull to the stage. My name is Tamakawa Stewi. I'm Ihoktawa Pabaska and Sisitan Dakota. I'm Hukpapa Sihasapa and Oguala Lakota. I come from the Standing Rock Reservation. We have 2.3 million acres, and I am the people of Sitting Bull. My people still exist. We are alive. Our culture is alive. Our language is alive, and we are alive. And never once have we ever stopped being warriors. We have fought and we will continue to fight. I told people, when we stand, we stand in prayer. We pray and then we'll come and we'll kill you. Just joking. <laughs> when all of this started, I am the tribal historian I compile history and genealogy of my people. I can tell you my people's history for 50,000 years and then even further back. I continually have to fight the Americans and the American government who came to my country to write our histories, to tell our histories, to tell us who we are and where we come from. I know where I'm from. The roots go right out of my feet down into the ground and you cannot disconnect me. I know who I am. What is that? That's empowerment. One of the things that I see across the whole world is people have forgot the directions. In my culture, we honor the directions, the north, the south, the east, the west, Father Sky, Mother Earth. But what I see is people forget the seventh direction the most, yourself. In this seventh direction, people have given that up. They've thrown it out there. They said, oh, a government can control me. Oh, a religion can control me. I am no longer empowered. I will wait for somebody to tell me what to do. I honor the seventh direction. And what I see everywhere I go, and no offense to anybody, because I say bad things all the time, I see women rising. I see women rising everywhere because they understand that seventh direction. They understand that innermost. They understand that it's our responsibility to change the world. They said, LaDonna, what do you want to do? I want to change the world. How do you do that? Stand up and fight back. How you fight back is different for every region, every people, every way. But you do it. Whether it's just changing your diet, whether it's growing food, whether it's planting trees, whether it's taking care of your animals, it is an action. How do you change the world? By empowering yourself. Not wait for some grandiose person to come and say, I'm a leader. Empower self. Self. We are in control of self. When did we become a people who waited for the government to save us? To wait for somebody else to come tell us how to live? We have something in all of us that we have to take out of the ground and bring it straight up inside you. 
and empower self to make you whole. What I find is so many people walk around with half of their pieces missing. Half of their pieces are everywhere because whether you like it or not, we have all come from traumatic lives, trauma. We are in the midst of war. My people have been at war since the United States came and stepped on my grounds. We have only wanted peace. I tell people at no time have my people ever been the aggressor. We have only been the defender. We have no other choice but to defend the land, the people, most of all the water. When I was going through, I found out that only 22% of pristine virgin land is left in this world. Think about that. And those pristine lands are in indigenous territories across the world. That means there's still a small portion of wildlife, bees, insects, birds, all of the things that keep the world in balance. And out of that 22%, 10% has fresh water. 10%. When we talk about water, it was like to Kashlar, God told us, this is your journey. You must protect the water. You have no choice. You must die to protect the water. Aha, uh -huh. we took that oath. So we have to stand for the water. Why? Because water is female. Because through water, we bring children into this world. It is through water that we care for our families, and we cook food, and we care, wash their clothes. It's through water that the tree grows, and the plants grow, and everything around us grows. It's through water we have life. So when we said, Mini Wachoni, water is life, that cry went to the world because it was the world's cry. It was not about us. It was nothing to do with us. It had to do with the world. You have the responsibility for protecting the water. If you protect the water, you protect life. That is a simple message. So today, is everybody hydrated? I think these people at Boone are doing a fantastic job constantly reminding people, drink water, drink water, drink water. Here in this kind of climate where it is a desert background, we need water. You can tell your bodies start getting sluggish without the water. Water is so important. So when they told us in 2014 they were going to come and build a pipeline and go through our water, we thought, they can't do that. And I, I would tell everybody, I said, everything that happened, there was no leaders, there was no plan, there was nothing, it just happened. In 2014, when they came to tell me they were gonna build this pipeline and wash day from our, our tribal historic preservation office called me in and she said, LaDonna, look at the map. And I said, oh my God, I'm the closest landowner. This is my backyard. And at that time in my life, I never considered myself an activist. At that time in my life, I'm just a historian. I spend my time in books and documents and recording people's histories. And, and the only thing that I thought, the only thing that went through my head is I'm a mom. That's it. And my son is buried on that hill. And who in the world would bury a pipeline across from my son's grave? When do I stop being a mom? Just because my son left this world? No, I'm a mom until the day I die. And so I have an obligation to protect my son. And I still am. Today, my husband lays next to my son. And so I will protect that land forever. So, in 2015, we continued to say no, and they stopped talking to us. They told the world, well, Standing Rock didn't respond. No, 
they took us off their meetings, their agendas, they forbid us to come to their things. You know how the government works. And as we were preparing our people for what was coming, there was a small group of people, and I will remember their names forever, Joy Brown, Joseph White Eyes, Jocelyn Charger, Riaka Eagleman. This one woman and these three young kids, kids, who said, start a camp. I was like, okay. So I took them down and showed them my home. They said, when do you want to start the camp? How about April 1st? In five days? Yes, we had no plan. So on April 1st, we put out a call to our nations. Osete Shakoin, our nation, is 14 reservations and nine Canadian reserves, my nation. So we sent out the word to my nation, and they came on horsebacks, they came on motorcycles, they walked, they ran, and the people came. And as I was coming out to my home, I noticed that teepees were going up, so there were seven teepees put up. And that first night, Joy Brown stayed the first night there without wood because there was nothing planned. And so the community brought in wood and food, and people started coming. The first actions we did was training. We trained people. How do we do this? I know where I live. I know because the color of my skin, I am hated. I know that when I go into the community, I am disliked. You know, they don't want me eating in the restaurants. They don't want me touching their food because I'm Indian. I know this. So the first thing we said was, we have to do this in a nonviolent direct action. Because if we do violence, they will kill us. They will come and kill us all because they have done it over and over again. And so we did training, nonviolent direct action. We brought everybody in, and how do we do this? Security culture, media culture. And one of the things that I constantly tell people, the center of everything is who controls the narrative. Who controls the narrative controls the world. And so the first thing the kids taught me, they said, Grandma, do you know about Facebook and Instagram and Twitter? And I was like, no, show me. Grandma, you need to do live stream. Okay, show me. It was the first time we used social media to do a movement that spread. You guys heard about us. Social media, from the mouth of the young people, let's not forget, everything we did was by their guidance. We had 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds telling us how to do this. This was a movement of young people. This was their voice, their movement, and they said something very simple. Look around us, nothing is going right. We need better lives. When you have young people tell you that, shouldn't you stand up to make a change? So then I remember on September 3rd, I was telling uh, Amy Goodman from Democracy Now! the story of my grandmother. Her name was Nape Hotawea, gray hand woman. She was nine years old when she was shot at the Whitestone Massacre. Everybody in her family was killed except her. And for some reason, the soldiers threw her in the back of a buckboard and, so, and took her to the prisoner war camps. So she lived, so I could be here. And so I was talking about this massacre and explaining that the people who killed us at this massacre, their grandsons were the police department of Morton County. I know who everybody is. I do genealogies. <laughs> and so as I was talking, I got the call, and they said, LaDonna, they're digging up the graves. And I said, what? 
They're digging up the graves now. They brought a bulldozer in. I said, there's not even no construction here yet. And so I said, okay. He said, we don't know what to do. I said, stop them. And he said, well, you know, I don't know. I said, call the women and children and push them in out of the way. Stop them. And I got in my car and I said, Amy, I got to go. I'm, I can't talk to you anymore. She said, I'm going with you. We drove up there just that they released the dogs on the people. And I got, uh, there was a whole group of women and children against the fence. So they, they pepper sprayed the whole group there. And I was like, oh, my God, what's happening here? And the woman with the dog and his mouth was running with blood as he was biting people. And there was a big pit bull here. And I was standing in the middle of this thinking, where am I? Is this all real? And I went up to, this, to the road, and a policeman was standing there, and I said, stop this. And he said, I'm only here to protect the road. And then I heard, Unchi, or Grandma, Grandma, get behind me. And a young man came on his horse and pushed the horse in between me and the dogs and started backing the, the dogs and the missionaries back. And we got them in their cars, and they drove off. And we were just shocked, because three days before, we went and marked all those graves. And we sent them to the judge, because we thought that was the right thing to do. And the judge gave them to Dakota Access, and Dakota Access came the next day and dug them all up. That's when I knew, for the first time, we were dealing with an unjust company an unjust corporation. How many people know that Dakota Access and Energy Transfer has bought all the TV stations and newspapers in North Dakota now? Who controls the media? So half of the stuff that came out is not really true. So today, I have people coming and asking me, well, what kind of strategy did you have? We didn't. What kind of plans did you make? We didn't. Who were the leaders? There wasn't any. What i seen through my own eyes is every group that came in had their own autonomy. Every tribal nation, every ally, Every indigenous group from across the world, they came in, they took care of their own, but they worked in a whole. I've never seen that before, except in the stories of our people. There was no leaders. There was a whole bunch of people working together. That was a big difference. There was no plan to say, you do this, you do this, and you do this. Everybody just did it. And then I remember standing there watching as all of these people came into this big, giant circle to pray after the days of the dogs. And I was thinking, where did all these people? There were a couple thousand people then. And I walked up on the road, and I was looking at that, and all I could see was these great big tall feathers. And I said, who is that? They said, oh, the Aztec came. Uh-huh. As they were smudging the people, I was watching the people coming, and I said, what is happening here? Am I seeing prophecy? Am I seeing the visions we've been told all of our lives before my eyes? When the seventh generation stands up to save the world, the seventh generation is all of our young people. When the black snake comes to devour the world and we stand up, if we do not, the world will end. When all the people can stand in one prayer, we can change the world. That is what I seen. I said, no matter what anybody says or does, nobody can take from my eyes what I seen. I seen every religious group in the whole world stand in one prayer. Tell me where that's happening right now. I seen every Aboriginal group in the whole world stand as one. And all of the rest of the people in the world stand as one. 
In a given time, we had 15,000 people living on the ground, and we had 100,000 people come through. Everybody who couldn't be there sent us flags, letters. We have scores of letters and offerings and prayers. And so I asked one lady that was from Canada, and I said, why did you come here? I see there's an oil spill in your country right now. And she said, because our spiritual leader said to come here, to offer that prayer here so that we can change our world. And so as I listened to these stories, I understood Standing Rock was not meant to last. Standing Rock was only this little thing here. And all that was was spread seed across the world to say, hey, people, wake up. We can all work together. We can change how we live now. We can stand together as a people. You take the one focus, water and earth, and make that your focus. You can change everything. We put up divisions so much that we don't even know who we are anymore. As I go around all over and see all of the amazing people who are standing up in their countries, in their ways, one of the things that I noticed was they know who they are. They know who they are that gave them that empowerment to change the world. It gave them that empowerment of courage to not be afraid. On those days when I went up to the front line and they were shooting people and I was standing there thinking, why is this happening? Why would they do that just because we said no? And then I said, well, this is what they always done. I knew at that moment in time they were afraid of us. They were afraid of people unifying. They were afraid of people changing. They were afraid of people standing together. They were afraid of people who would stop all the disunity and stand as a people. That's a very frightening thing because if you do that, Corporations lose their power. Bad governments lose their power. When you understand that there is only one thing in life, water, and without water we all die, that one thing that brings life, that one thing, we can all stand on that one thing. So what have we been doing? I always tell people, you have a negative. We had this pipeline. We know they've done everything in their power. The pipeline is in. We know that. But I'm still there. I know Tina said, LaDonna, you can't say you're going to dig it up. I know. But, <laughs> but right now, what do you do with a, a, a negative? You make a positive. So the first thing we did was cleaned up trash. So right now, the place where the camps existed, every native plant, flower, and medicine has grown. It's better than when it was before the camps were there because we had all this problems, not just weeds and stuff. It's beautiful. We can actually go and pick medicines down there now. Because the camp existed, it replenished the earth. And my point with that is humans are a part of this earth. We need to continue to be a part of this earth. We just have to have that respect for earth because we can replenish our lands again. And then I thought, how do we make change? So I told everybody, plant something. Plant. The first act of sovereignty is food. 
Just think what it'd be if we stopped going to go to grocery stores to buy food and we grew our own. So we have huge gardens now. And because of our history, in 1949, the Pick Sloan decided that my land was expendable, that we are expendable people. They built a dam above us and it built a dam below us, making us the damn Indians, which took out all our trees. They took all our forests, so we have no more trees. And so we planted 350 trees that first spring after the camp shut down, and we continue to plant trees. That is not enough. So then we started on the tip of my river, the Cannonball, all the way down, and we picked up and cleaned up our riverbeds. And I asked the whole world, if you want to make a change, go clean your ponds, your lakes, your creeks, your oceans, your streams. We can do it. One person can do it. Then, as Tina can tell you, we picked up garbage everywhere. Just terrible. I carry garbage sacks everywhere I go. And then now, we started a program where feeding elders. Because on my reservation, and how many people understand concept of reservation? Where I live, we are the lowest poverty people in the United States. I think the average income is 12000 a year if they're lucky. Food is a major component. And so my daughter was saying, Mom, I went over to the elders and I got no food. And I, so we started off um, making soup and bread and taking it to elders' homes every Sunday, just feeding people. And we keep pots. I told people, if you want to change the world, feed somebody. Feed people. Then... We looked at our homes because nobody will come and help us with construction or anything, so we don't have those kind of services where I live. So we started a small repair of elders' homes, fixing doors and, and stuff, and started a construction company. And then we started our own architect company because we need to design earth-friendly homes for people. Something that you live with the earth. But all of this really makes no difference if you don't empower the youth. So Tina here, she works with the youth. We do youth media. We are teaching the youth how to create their own videos, how to edit their own videos, how to fly drones, how to tell their story. Who controls the narrative, controls the world. And I keep on thinking every day as people come, what are you doing? Are you comfortable? If you're comfortable, then something's wrong with you because you should be standing up everywhere. Right now, we are down to 170 water protectors still going to court. All of the people who are serving federal terms for coming up and standing for the water are all indigenous. All the non-natives, they drop their charges. It's just that like that in my country. And I try to go to all the trials right now with the new court hearings. As you know, Dakota Access never had a permit to cross the water. Dakota Access never had a permit to build the pipeline. Dakota Access paid $1,500 fines for digging up the grave sites. Dakota Access did not own the land and it did not have title to the land, as they said. Dakota Access gave $11 million to the State Historical Society so they can clear the land. Dakota Access gave, was it $10 million to the Morton County Police. They gave $11 million to the fire department. They gave seven million to the University of Mary, and we are there suffering the propaganda. So they constantly do their rhetoric about us and us Indian people. That just tickles me no end because I know they're afraid. 
We have stood up and continue to stand up. My people have only had contact for 140 years, not like the rest of the people. And we are one of the people who have not lost our language, our culture, our tradition, our way of life. And I tell people, I said, because I grew up with my grandma, I didn't even get to eat white people food till 1969, and I think it was white bread they brought to our house in bologna. Before that, we just had our garden hunted and fished. And so, at that, our people have not adapted to the other culture very well. As you know, right now, and I was thinking about this, listening to the people talk about what's happening in Nicaragua and El Salvador and Hernandez and Guatemala and South America and the new policies America is doing with immigration as they've taken all the children away. But to me, that is a normal American policy because they took all of us away. The American policy is to destroy a people, you remove the children. And so for me, I'm a boarding school. It wasn't that long ago when we had to make our ways home. It is not something in the past. It is now. It is me. And I thought, as I went and we prayed at one of the concentration camps where these poor children are, oh my God, do they know what they're creating? They're creating a whole generation of warriors who will stand up against them. Oppression does not make oppressed people after a while. It makes courageous people who stand up. And we are at that point now. So where are you? And how many of you are standing up here in Portugal as I came all this way to tell your people not to frack and not to allow offshore drilling? How many of you are knocking on that prime minister's door? Because I sure would. How many of the Portuguese are saying they want to live? How many of the Portuguese are going to stand up for their water. Ah, hey, I've been down to your beaches. They're amazing and beautiful. And they should be protected. How many? You know, when I first came last year, it was like, oh my God, I just landed in Portugal, where Columbus is from the man of genocide, and the man who came to my country and killed millions, the first transatlantic slave trader. I know, we see you. And then I met the Portuguese people, and I thought, what amazing, beautiful people here. What amazing, beautiful people. I seen your community. They took me where the fires were last year. And I said, why are there fires here? Oh, they got a foreign tree they brought over here that doesn't belong here, that eats up all the moisture, to make paper. And I said, well, why did you guys allow it? It's a corporation, corporations control. So I guess Portugal is the same as the rest of us controlled and owned by a corporation. And it's time for people to be empowered. It's time for people to be able to have a say in their own life. It's time for everyone to empower their self. Because I fear our young people will empower their self to stand up because we deserve a better life. 
we should not live in a society where one group is disliked for having blue hair, or one group is disliked for saying this prayer, or one group is disliked for the type of clothes they wear, or one group is disliked for their sexual orientation. That is not even human. Everybody has a right to live. And we have to stop the divisions. And I think that's what this is, right? This is a place where everybody can be free to express their self. Everybody can be free. We should be able to have that freedom everywhere, not just at a festival. We should be able to have that freedom in our homes. How do you do that? You stand up together, you be kind to each other, be good to each other. I grew up with this whole idea, our concept of, I'm Indian. I'm not good enough to sit in the restaurant with all those white people. I remember we had my cousin, my cousin was light skinned, so we'd always push her in to order for us because they wouldn't or get, let, take our orders. <laughs> We always had our token so we can at least get food. That is my reality. I do not think that reality should be something our children have to live with. So, all that happened at Standing Rock, it's just a seed. And everybody was supposed to take one of those seeds and take it and plant it all over the world so that we can make an active movement to save the water. If we save the water, we save ourselves. If we save the water, we save the animal kingdom. If we save the water, we save the earth. If we save the water, we save ourselves. And so to me, that one small message, water is life, should be in everybody's words, everybody's voice, everybody speaking. Because water is not judgmental. Water is female, but water gives life to everyone. And so for me, at this time in this place, I hope that everybody stands up for the water. I hope that everybody can stand for the water. I think that if we could take that concept of water, we can change everything. And I go back to what I tell Tina all the time. Who controls the media controls the world. Right now, some of the stuff that's coming out on TV, on Facebook, on media, is not good. Right now, the government has put the kibosh on everything. So Facebook is not an option anymore. As I sat in the courts with all the water protectors, they brought in every one of their Facebook posts and Facebook messages because they are legal in any court of law. Everything you put on social media now can be used in any court as evidence against you. Second, I learned about facial recognition as they convicted two people. Nobody could say where these two people were. Nobody identified them, but they brought a man in and he opened a crowd like this. He pointed out for this elderly lady and said she was standing right there. She didn't do anything, but they convicted. They sent her to jail for facial recognition. We had nine different militia groups, paid soldiers to come at us at Standing Rock. We had live rounds that were shot, but the media is not going to tell you that. They killed horses. They had rubber bullets, bean bags. I was just talking to one of the water protectors that were hit with one. It took out his eye. He's blind. It 
crush the uh, bones in his face. Sophia with her loss of her arm. Susie with the loss of her eye. And we can go on. With Dave from my camp, the rubber bullet shot the top of his knuckles and took out all his knuckles so he can never use his hand. And I think about all these people, all they wanted to do was come and help us. They wanted to come and help. Fearless, amazing warriors. I seen a young man, he was from Puerto Rico. And I went up and they had just maced him again. And I said, you know, you gotta stay off the front line. He said, don't worry, grandma, don't even hurt me anymore. I said, geez, you guys. The young people went every day, every day, as they pushed us back, as the oil company used the government, the state, the police departments, paid militia, and you're going to see more of that across the world. They are not only coming to cause harm, they are coming to kill us. I know that. I talked with all of my friends in South America, and they're dying. They're dying. They're standing up against mining and the dams and the destruction. I remember a man from Bolivia came to me and said, oh, I am so happy to meet you, the people of the heart, because us from Bolivia are the people of the lungs. Each indigenous group has a piece of the Mother Earth that we are in charge of taking care of. We at the Lakota Dakota Nation have been given the heart of the world to protect. And so we must protect it. Our stories are so old. I remember when I was 14 and an elderly man came to me and he said, how come we're still alive? They poisoned us, they killed us, they gave us diseases, they massacred us, they took our land and we're still here. Why are we still here? It's because we have original instruction to save the world. And we must live for that component to save the world. And so as we are taught this, as I'm taught my grandchildren, that is our purpose in life, to save the world, to save the water. And so we don't have a choice. We have to do it for all of you. When, when we stood up, we did not think it was going to be like this. When we stood up, we had no idea anybody would stand behind us. My dear friend, Pua Case from Hawaii, who's standing for the mountain, she told me, LaDonna, how many people do you think will come? I said, I would be so honored if 50 people came and stood with me. So now we made our commitment to stand forever with the Hawaiians as they fight for the mountain. We know through our original teachings that each of these are important. So. Mauna Kea is one of the mountains that goes all the way to the center of the earth. And through Mauna Kea, it keeps the world stable. And if you destroy Mauna Kea, you destroy everything. And we also know that as a world twirls and goes in this big circle, it's just like me as I'm getting old, my knees need that lubrication, so does the earth. But these people are sucking it out and putting salt water in there. And so the earth is, and you see what we're up to, about 400 earthquakes a day now. Did you know they stopped reporting it in the press and the media? So you can obliviously not know what's happening in the world. The volcanoes are all becoming active. And today, what is going to happen here in a little bit? The eclipse, the longest eclipse, any time the world has an eclipse, it pulls gravity. So you will see more happening. If we had more trees, if we had 
our water systems, if we had all of these things to make the earth in balance, it wouldn't be such a threat. But we have diminished a lot of our nature and our world. And so we no longer have that protection. As we cut the lungs down in the Amazon, we will not breathe. As we take the water of life away, we will not live. I'm just asking everybody to live. Asking the world to live. For, for all the propaganda that was out there about what happened at Standing Rock, I've choose not to deal with it because some of it was just comical. We shot arrows at planes. We butchered cattle. None of that ever happened. <laughs> um, we got accused of a lot of things. We made millions of dollars off GoFundMe. No. Everybody, everybody was a paid protester down there. Nobody got paid. That the environmental companies came in and were the ones telling us what to do. No. Greenpeace, all the environmental groups didn't come in till November and December when the camps were closing. It was indigenous movement, it was indigenous people, and it was our voice. Who is indigenous? Everybody. Everybody. And I want you to understand, if you are born in this country, you're indigenous to this country. If you are born here, you're indigenous to that country. Everybody is indigenous to their, their land. And so it's not an idea of a certain group of people, it's everybody. At camp, I got into a lot of trouble. And I just, I just got to tell you, God, I always cause trouble because I don't know exactly what's going on in the whole world. So I had this amazing woman come up to me. And, she's, and it was so cold that day. And all us women were on the front line praying. It was so cold. In my country, it's cold like 40, 30 below on the average where you're eyelashes freeze together. It was so cold and this woman came up and said, here's a scarf. And she wrapped this beautiful white scarf around me and I was like, oh wow, that was so warm, it was so nice. And the next day in the paper they said, LaDonna stands with Palestine. And I was like, yeah, I do, but what has that got to do? So then all of a sudden I got all this hate mail. And so my friend said, hey LaDonna, we got an Israel flag, okay. Then I got all this hate mail, and I was like, wait, 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 wait. Come on, people. This is nonsense. You have to stand together. You have to stand together. I am not picking sides in anywhere in the world except against corporations. And right now, if you look at a corporation, a corporation is not a religious, a culture, a way of life. It is a corporation. And those corporations rule the world right now. And so I am against corporations. I have heard every scenario you can imagine. So, you drive a car, so that's hypocrisy. And so a nice man came from Hawaii and gave me an electric car. That was cool. I tell everybody, what do you do at this time? You diverse. Make a 20-year plan, and each year you divest. Whether it's divesting from plastics, whether it's divesting from fossil fuel, whether it is, and the end result, to be one with the earth again. Then I also tell people, remember, you're the power. So divest your money and any bank that f finances fossil fuel. I've been to most of the banks across the world. 
reminding them that in their own policies and procedures, they will not endorse anybody does human rights violations. And oil companies do human rights violations. Then we went to the insurance company and said, don't insure them because they do human rights violations. Then we went to the creditors who credit rate them and said, you know what these guys are? And then we said, Grandma, take out your $5 out of that bank and invest it into a local community bank that invests in your community. Let's start investing money into our own communities and not investing into corporations. So I think we're somewhere around $64 billion we've divested. Divestment is power. If you want to do something, don't support any bank that supports corporations. And you can change the world. Empowerment is in your hands. Nobody else. Empowerment is you. And you can make that choice. And as I tell everybody, if you want to make a change, clean up your environment, pick up garbage, clean your waterways. We can do this. We can make a change because the world belongs to us. Right now, as we sit in the middle of the largest extinction of animals, what are we doing? Everything in this world is here for a balance. And so we need to do our best. We need to do our best to find that balance. But I tell everybody, you know, through this whole process of whatever this is, whatever this is, I have no idea. I only know that I come from a long line of big mouth women. And I had no other choice but to follow my grandmother and my mother. I remember as I was standing at that front line and those guns were pointed on us and I was thinking, oh, to Kashala, please. I'm so glad my mother and my grandmother are dead because there is no way possible I could keep them from being nonviolent because they would have already climbed over that and beat up those cops. <laughs> but my point is, that was the generation before. In my generation, we understand that there's a different way. So at camp, I thought, I went home and I told my husband, I said, I think I'm going to start a camp. My husband's a school teacher. He was like, what? I said, I'm going to start a camp. He said, okay, I'm here. I'm praying for you. And then I went to my daughter and she said, I'm not having nothing to do with that, Mom. Okay. So I got down there. My daughter formed her own camp, had her own group of people. She said, what do you want me to do, Mom? I said, be crazy, horse. She said, what? Duck and dive, never stand still. She wasn't arrested, but on a non-action. And then my grandsons. I have 18 grandsons. 18 grandsons, I know. No power. But I do have one granddaughter. Save the world. But all my grandsons were at camp. We had a school for the kids at camp. We had free health care for everybody. We had everybody who came could look at alternative medicine, look at massages, how do we be in balance? We had people helping people with nobody giving instruction to help people. And I remember this one lady, I always tell the story about this lady from Virginia who came, she was an elderly lady. And I always ask, why did you come here? And she said, when I heard your call, I waited this, for this my whole life. I was like, okay, I'm talking to this elderly white woman. She came, she said, but let me tell you about my arrival. She said, I didn't, I've never been to a reservation. I don't know much about your people. Never been to North Dakota, but I packed up everything and I started driving and I think, God, I must be crazy. 
She said, so by the time I got to the camp, it was the middle of the night, and I pulled up to the security gate. The security man walked up to my car, and he looked at me, and he said, welcome home. And she said, that was the most amazing thing anybody said to me. And I pulled down in camp, and a young man ran up and said, hey, you need a place to camp over here. And she pulled up over there, and two young men said, we'll put up your tent for you. And then she said, I crawled in my tent, and I could hear people singing and praying everywhere. And at the camp, we had concerts every night. So they were singing and praying and dancing everywhere. And then she said, when I opened my eyes, they were singing and praying everywhere. And I walked out of my tent, and a young man said, Grandma, you need a cup of coffee. And then the lady said, come, come eat at my, my camp for breakfast. And she said, I got over there, they put her a chair down, and she sat down, and they brought her a plate of food. And she said, at that moment, my whole life changed because for my whole life, nobody has ever been that kind to me. And that was how I looked at camp, where people came together and helped everybody. People came together, never race, creed, color. If you're blue, purple, or orange, you came together and helped each other. And nobody can take that from my eyes that I seen. Nobody can take that away from me. But what I do know is each and every one of you can do it. So with that, if you guys so desire, when we finish here, I'm asking everybody to come to the water and we are going to do an action. We are going to make the flower of this place to send a message to Portugal to say they must protect the water. So, so with that, does anybody have any questions? We got like 10, 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. My, my thought always is with wars or with these corporations doing their thing, you have these cowardish uh, so-called leaders who stand with their money and their suits and they have all these ideas. But none of that would work if it wasn't the foot soldiers willing to do the dirty work because th those leaders are not courageous enough to do the dirty work themselves. And I think that about every war, if it wasn't for the foot soldiers doing the dirty work and actually suffering for these cowards, do you have any insight on that? What, what to do about these foot soldiers that are willing to do the dirty? Because without them, the corporations wouldn't get as far or, or all the wars wouldn't get as far as they are. So we had a lot of dealings with infiltrators. The U.S. Army picked native people who were a part of the armed service and gave them orders to come into the camp to cause disruption, to try to incite violence, to try to incite um, actions that weren't something we would do. It is by the good grace of the people in camp who stopped a lot of it, but the infiltrators are like sheep. They will follow. And that's why I think it's so important for each individual to empower their self. Because at no time should you give your unrestricted loyalty to an entity. You give your unrestricted loyalty to your family, to your mothers, your fathers, your children, to your land. But you do not give it to a corporation or a government because they will use you. And that's what I see about these foot shoulders. The, the paid militia that came in, they do not care. They will kill me and they will kill you. And everybody's day is coming. Everybody's day is coming. We have to be able to raise our children with that idea of empowerment now. To empower our youth to make their own decisions. 
It is in our hands. A father came and said, I am so sorry I stood with you, but my son was under orders. And I said, then we need to find him and take him to ceremony and heal him. In my culture, we still have all of our ceremonies to heal. We heal the soldiers that come back from war. We heal the people who have blood on their hands. We heal the widow who lost her husband. Everything about what we have is ceremony because we are still connected to the earth. And so we have to heal the people. My tribe comes from Southern Africa and I stood with you in Southern Africa and I shared as many posts as I could. And I was always constantly reminded that we make our stand every moment that we choose. And I feel that perhaps if you could gift us all something, I know we'll do the water, but I'm talking about more a daily practice to help us maintain our center in, in some small ceremony that we could be gifted with, please. Anything. You know, I'm only who I am and I'm not anything. And the only thing I have is prayer. I pray every day, every moment. I have to some days to get through. Every day as I walk here, I don't walk by myself. And I don't care who people pray to. I don't care how they pray, as long as they pray. I remember we have, a, we have a ceremony, our NIPI, our sweat lodges, and Ambrose, our leader, used to say, pray hard, even if you're just praying to get out of here. At least you're praying. And so I pray all the time because I have no gifts. I have nothing to give to people. All I got is a big mouth. And I'm getting old, which makes me fearless. And so... All I can ask you is to pray. And when you do that, according to our way, you put your feet on the ground, you touch the earth. We tell people, if you want to heal, then put your feet on the ground. Take the shoes off, feel the earth, because the earth has the energy that comes right out of the ground to heal you. It's right there and it's always been there. All you have to do is be able to grab it. To be able to get rid of those bags of garbage we carry on our backs, our hurt, our pain, our sorrows. We carry them and we hang on to them so tight. We just have to place them down and accept that healing from the earth. So take your feet off and pray. That's all I can say. Take your, feet. Take your shoes off, not your feet. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Um, I just wanted to say my husband and I are from Colorado and we supported the entire, cool. the entire Standing Rock. Uh, we sent gifts to your tribe. We made our community aware of everything that was going on. Um, my husband is an herbalist. We cool. live on an acre and we grow food for our community. Um, and we've been on a trip for the past three weeks traveling throughout Portugal, Iceland, here, to see different ways of different people. Um, it gets very hard living in the States with everything yes. that goes on every single day because you're just like, is this real? Is this reality? <laughs> and we surround ourselves with very strong people. But again, even with prayer, sometimes it, it seems like you're fighting against an impossible fight. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for coming here and spreading your prayer. But we have each other. We have each other. Because yes, it gets hard. There are days when I just, I just say, I don't want to do this anymore. But I know I cannot stop. 
And so Pua Kais calls me from Hawaii. Our Winona LaDuke calls me. Our Cheryl down at the bayou. And we just tell each other every day. We stand, we stand, and we stand with each other. Give support to each other. It helps. And it makes you fearless. Because nobody stands alone. You can be the first one to stand. And everybody stands with you. Nobody stands alone. Support each other. Support each other. That's all I can say. So is it. Oh, yeah. Hello. My name is Jose. Um, Hi, Jose. I'm from California. Um, I believe I'm from Aztec descent. And I just want to take the moment and say thank you for traveling all the way over here and doing what is right for our land. And it pains me to see that we're still dealing with these issues. And sometimes I find myself in moments where I don't know what to do, what is my next action to take. But from me to you, our ancestors are there, and they're always here guiding us. So I know you mentioned earlier that, you know, we're different from where we came from and how our family was before. But for me to you, don't ever forget that our ancestors are here guiding us. And don't ever feel like you can't make the next day go by because they are here, and I'm here with you. Thank so. you. Let me tell you a story. Ihani, a long time ago, 2012 happened, and they said, oh, the end of the world's gonna happen. E whatever. <laughs> but for indigenous people, it did. It ended our thought of colonialization. 2013, the sacred red year, we rose up, idle no more. 2014, we gathered and formed relationships. 2015, we sent a ripple into the world. 2016, we stood up. 2017, we spread to every corner of the world. 2018, we will make the change. And don't forget, in the American continent, we're one people. We're one people. I would love an amazing, warm applause for LaDonna Brabel Allard. Thank you, Tony! Thank you, Tony!